Hello, everyone. Welcome. Just give it a few minutes while people join and see the numbers popping up. Do please feel free to introduce yourselves in the chat. Perhaps tell us if you're yet a signatory to the Knowledge Equity Network Declaration. Somebody's got their hand up. That's my colleague, Rachel. Do you want to say anything, Rachel, or are you just putting your hand up? <laughs> Is there no chat? That might be a problem. Yeah. Okay, I'll get going because we haven't got a great deal of time and lots of um, speakers to get through. And my slides seem to be doing their own thing for some reason. So welcome, everybody. So this is uh, very exciting today to have uh, several colleagues from different parts of the world, in fact. So uh, just to introduce myself, I'm Open Research Advisor at Leeds and also Senior Lead for the Knowledge Equity Network. For those that aren't familiar with the Knowledge Equity Network, it's uh, an initiative that seeks to open access to education research and to shift the culture of higher education towards collaboration rather than competition. So a collaborative community of engaged institutions, organisations and individuals across the world. And we obviously encourage you to join us if you haven't already done so. Um, and the principles of the Declaration on Knowledge Equity, which uh, I'll post a link to in a moment, um, on which the network was founded, set out a way of us working in global partnership towards the United Nations uh, Sustainability uh, Development Goals and a fairer and better world. So that's sort of a bit of a background on the open on the, on the Knowledge Equity Network. Um, and today we're going to be hearing from uh, Lucy from uh, Wikimedia UK, uh, Jody, a colleague of mine from the University of Leeds, who's a, a in our special collections and uh, very excited to introduce as well a couple of colleagues Anuba and Sneha from the Centre for Internet Society and Society in India. So they're joining us from India uh, where it's half past two in the afternoon I think. Um, so as I say I'm not going to say much because I want to hand over and listen to our head, head from our speakers but um, just to put this in the broader context of open research in the UK HE there's a blog post there that I'll share as well that um, discusses you know how strategically important that is in the UK. And obviously my day job as Open Research Advisor, I deal with sort of open access, open and fair data and all that side of things and reproducible research, et cetera, in, in a university context. And I've long been a champion of um, Wikimedia as a really important way of um, sort of joining the different strands of open research and open education together. I posted a quick blog post that you can find there at that bit.ly link. Again, I'll post that in the chat in, in a moment. So as I say, we'll be hearing from several colleagues. Wikimedia is a thread that runs through this. So we're starting with Lucy. Um, on uh, Wikimedia, so just a couple of points there about some of the things she'll be talking about, but I'll, I'll let her pick up on that. Um, and then, uh, as I say, our colleagues Sneha and Anuba from um, India talking about some of the problems posed by copyright to research in a global environment and a little bit about the access to knowledge programme that they've been working again with Wikimedia, I think, on there, before finally hearing from uh, my colleague Jody um, about openness and special collections, especially in terms of risk management and how we can be more radically open in that area. But just before I do hand over to Lucy, I just want to draw the parallels really between um, the Knowledge Equity Network. So on the left hand side there, you can see um, this sort of summary statement from the Knowledge Equity Network. And on the right hand side, um, a similar statement from the Wikimedia Foundation. As I say, the link there, if you do want to sign up to the declaration is at the bottom. Um, and really just to acknowledge that, you know, Wikimedia have doing, been doing this quite a lot longer than we have. Um, you know, and they've got the infrastructure, the open infrastructure to sort of facilitate um, um, open research, open education, and to bring communities together across the world. So I'm very interested to hear from Lucy. So without further ado, I shall stop sharing and hand over to you, Lucy, if that's okay. Sure, thank you. Um, so just bear with me while I uh, find my slides. Oh, why have you popped up? Um, I mean, you're interesting, but oh, now we have Spotify. This is marvellous. Um, <laughs> sorry, folks. Uh, here we go. Um, seamless, right. So it'd be great if someone just could give me a shout if um, that first slide is visible in full screen. That's great, that's showing. Great, thank you. Well, hi everybody. Um, thank you very much to Nick for that introduction, but also I want to take this moment to thank you for the fantastic work you're doing at the University of Leeds. Um, and as you say, you know, acting as a real champion for how working with Wikimedia can be a real enabler um, in terms of open access and um, open data and open research. 
Um, so Wikimedia UK, clues in the name, we're the national charity for the global Wikimedia movement. Um, and I am going to talk just a little bit about, about that movement um, and the, the licensing structure that, that underpins it before getting into some, some examples of how people are working with knowledge equity. Um, so the global movement includes hundreds and thousands of individual volunteer contributors. Um, we also use the word editors um, and well over a hundred affiliated organizations. Um, and they either have a geographic focus like Wikimedia Argentina or Wikimedia Community Ireland, um, or sometimes a thematic focus like Wikimedia Project, Wiki Project Medicine, Art and Fem Feminism, or Black Lunch Table, all of which are probably quite obvious from, from the title. And the Wikimedia Foundation and uh, Nick shared uh, some of their, their um, uh, sort of aspirations earlier. The Wikipedia Foundation is the non-profit organization based in the United States that hosts Wikipedia and Wikipedia's other free knowledge projects, which include Wikidata, a free and open knowledge base that can be read and edited by humans and machines, and Wikimedia Commons, which is the media repository for the movement and which I think is shortly going to hit its 100 millionth um, item. So Wikipedia itself exists in over 300 languages, it has over 61 million articles, and receives around 11 billion views a month. Um, and Wikimedia is built on openly licensed content. So most text on Wikipedia has been shared under the Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike 4.0 International License, uh, more commonly known as CC BY SA, um, and the GNU Free Documentation License. And Wikimedia Commons only accepts free content, which are images and other media files that, are, that aren't subject to copyright restrictions, which would pre prevent them from being used by anyone, anytime and for any purpose. Um, so just as an aside, non-commercial licenses are not compatible with any of the Wikimedia projects. And that means that they're usually licensed under um, uh, the CC by SA 4.0 license, or they're in the public domain in both the US and the source country of the work. So the way that information is created, curated and distributed on Wikipedia and the sister projects with all content freely accessible and freely editable for everyone has been a distinctive feature of the Wikimedia project since English Wikipedia was launched in January 2001. And in and of itself, that commitment to equal access and the open licensing infrastructure that, that underpins that represents a significant contribution to knowledge equity. Indeed, Wikipedia's founder, Jimmy Wales, asks us to imagine a world in which every single person on the planet is given free access to the sum of all knowledge. However, while open access is an important component of knowledge equity, it's by no means the whole story. We need to ensure that Wikimedia is collecting knowledge that fully represents human diversity um, and builds services and structures that enable others to do the same. As a social movement, we focus our efforts on knowledge and communities that have been left out by structures of power and privilege. And we work to break down the social, political, and technical barriers that prevent people from accessing and contributing to free knowledge. So at Wikimedia UK, and for many other entities and individuals working on and with Wikimedia, addressing bias in Wikimedia's content and the lack of rep representation amongst its contributors is crucial. So I'm sharing here uh, the taxonomy of gaps on Wikimedia, which was produced by Miriam Reddy and others within the Wikimedia Foundation's research team. And this breaks that gap into three different areas, as you can, I mean, I don't expect you to be able to read everything on the outside circle, but that inner circle, readers, content and contributors. So for, for existing and potential readers, there are issues around access, um, such as internet connectivity, motivation, technical skills, as well as socio-demographic aspects, such as gender, age, education, income, and so on. And for contributors, those same facets come into play with well-documented gaps relating to gender, and also more recent data that shines a light on how poorly represented Black and Asian people are among the editing communities in the UK and the US. So the taxonomy of gaps it describes the content of Wikipedia as being incomplete by design, as the opportunity to share new information with the world is a major motivating factor among both new and established editors. But it does acknowledge that when important information about a topic is absent, incomplete, biased, or otherwise inaccessible to readers, that these content gaps can undermine Wikipedia's ability to serve the needs of our global audience. But it's certainly true that Wikipedia's content gaps, and in some cases, the systemic bias that underpins those gaps, act as a motivating force for people to get involved themselves. 
So some examples of this from the UK include the IDEA network at St Andrews University, established by Dr Kirsty Ross. So IDEA stands for Inclusion, Diversity, Equity and Accessibility and Open Knowledge in this context, with Kirsty working with a young academic, Abd al Sattar Arditi, and supported by Wikimedia UK's programme manager in Scotland, having run 25 events, trained over 250 new editors, and overseen edits on Wikipedia that have resulted in nearly 3 million article views since the launch of the network in April 2021. Editing Wikipedia, as well as being a form of digital volunteering, is also a type of knowledge activism, where students and others can act as critical creators of knowledge. At the University of the Arts in London, we worked with Lucy Panesar on a year-long secondment to Wikimedia UK, funded by the University's Knowledge Exchange Programme, to run the Decolonising Wikipedia Network. That started life at the London College of Communications, which is part of UAL, and was set up by Lucy and the student changemakers at the college. The network supported students and staff to edit Wikipedia through the lenses of anti-racism and decolonisation including increasing the visibility and the credibility of underrepresented and marginalized figures and topics connected to UAL's subject disciplines on Wikipedia. Wikimedians across the world recognize the value of working with educators and other partners, as well as directly with students to develop information literacy skills. Our projects are designed to enable participants to critically evaluate information and develop a greater understanding of how to assess content and references, identify potential bias, and understand some of the ethical and political issues associated with the production of knowledge, as well as the use of and access to information. At the University of Edinburgh, where we have a very long-standing Wikimedia in residence, Ewan McAndrew, the Assistant Vice Principal, Melissa Highton, who I'm pretty sure Nick knows, uh, reflected that the work has embedded information literacy skills in the curriculum and editing Wikipedia enables students to understand sources and copyright and leads into discussions about privilege, the privilege and geography of knowledge. So I would argue that embedding openness in knowledge production is essential to knowledge equity. Within another higher education partnership, this time at the University of Oxford's Bodleian Libraries, the Wikimedian of Residence, Dr. Martin Poulter, who I know, again, Nick knows and works with, his work was focused on surfacing world histories that were underrepresented on Wikipedia and sharing imagery and other content to which people have previously had very limited access. He also worked with researchers at the university to ingest new information into Wikidata, the knowledge base I mentioned earlier, and he created new visualization tools to bring that data to life and make it accessible and reusable. Wikipedia allows researchers to communicate research results and expertise in the place where people the majority of people look for that information, which is in the relevant Wikipedia articles. Engaging with Wikipedia, all the other Wikimedia projects, and I've mentioned a few, but another really important one to note is Wikijournals, is one of the most effective ways to share knowledge and to enable research outputs to be used, reused, remixed, and repurposed by other researchers, by educators, by translators, by data scientists, by policy makers, by organizations, and by individuals. At Wikimedia UK, our mission is to enable people to engage with open knowledge and access reliable information in order to develop their understanding of the world and make informed decision about issues that affect them. So ensuring open access to research is crucial to that mission, as well as to our vision of a more informed, democratic and equitable society through open knowledge. So I'm delighted to have been um, able to participate in this morning's webinar, really excited to hear the next speakers and look forward to any questions and comments that you might have at the end. Thank you very much. I'm going to start Great. Thanks screen. very much, Lucy. That was brilliant. I'm sorry um, about the chat issue, which we don't seem able to switch it on during the webinar. So apologies about that. But please do post any questions in the Q&A. Uh, or comments, in fact, um, given that we don't have a chat feature. Um, but now I will hand over to Sneha. Um, first, uh, speaking first, I think. Um, are you ready, Sneha? Hopefully your tech's still working. Yes, I, I hope I'm audible and uh, visible. Hi, everyone. Um, right. Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks so much, uh, Nick, for the introduction. And thanks, uh, Lucy, for that wonderful uh, presentation. I think... Uh, it's a great, uh, great segue for me into uh, what I wanted to speak about as part of this uh, this talk. Um, so I'm a, uh, I'm a researcher with the Center for Internet and Society in India, 
um, as the name suggests, you know, we do um, policy and academic research um, on the internet, digital you know, infrastructures um, and technology in India. And uh, in the course of my um, time here, I've had the opportunity to engage with uh, with uh, Wikimedia projects, with the open knowledge movement more broadly. So I thought I'd share some reflections, um, learnings from that space um, and how it may speak to you know, our larger sort of topic today, which is on um, open research. Um, so um, at, at CIS, we have um, a program uh, called Access to Knowledge, which works very closely with Indian language uh, Wikimedia projects. Um, there are a total of uh, 23 Indian languages uh, that have Wikimedia projects, and the A2K program um, has been able to engage with uh, several of them uh, in, in different capacities. Um, and I think easily with about you know, 20 of those uh, projects. And this is largely in terms of sort of catalyzing the growth of these you know, Indic language, Indian language Wikimedia communities across different projects. Um, you know, Wikipedias themselves, Wikidata, uh, Wikimedia Commons, um, different, you know, different projects in these spaces. Um, in 2019, we started a sort of a small pilot initiative to do research um, with Indian language Wikimedia communities. Um, this was really sort of um, motivated by, you know, lots of different interesting questions that kept coming up uh, within the Indian language Wikimedia space. And also it's its connection to a larger conversation around just the development of Indian language content, right? And of course, increasing sort of digitization, digitalization, the push for a digital India, um, as such, right, and language being such such an important part of that uh, of that discourse, and of course, definitely, um, you know, open source and open infrastructures, open digital infrastructures, forming a key component again in that conversation. Um, so we, um, over the course of three years, we did um, several, you know, interesting uh, projects. I think a total of nine small projects. Um, the idea was really to sort of identify gaps, challenges, opportunities. Um, with various aspects of content creation, participation, learning, access and outreach in Indian language Wikimedia projects, and also to develop, say, you know, some sort of recommendations, best practices, etc., towards addressing some of these challenges and um, optimizing available resources. So um, what we came across, and I'll very briefly, and we uh, didn't have a lot of time, I'll very briefly go through some of these um, sort of learnings. One is, of course, um, and Lucy sort of spoke about uh, some of this in our presentation as well, just the sort of uh, content gaps that exist and continue to exist, right? Um, so, you know, the area of content in Indian languages that remains unavailable for wider public access because of issues of digitization, translation, awareness, implementation of um, open access policies, um, the lack of technological, infrastructural, and policy-related knowledge that uh, exacerbates disparities in content creation, access, and use. Um, issues of diversity, diversity bias in content um, creation and participation, so and in the content itself. So the work on gender gap, for instance, is, is good sort of is an important reflection really of the content and participation gaps that affect this you know, picture of knowledge that is produced on open knowledge uh, collaborative platforms, um, the need for capacity building. So really, you know, areas of training, awareness in technological communication, uh, media, communi community health and policy related issues. And of course, you know, a lot of sort of process related um, learnings and challenges. Um, I think the key sort of questions that that, you know, this whole sort of exercise really um, put forth for us, I mean, the sort of key learnings and takeaways. Um, one is, of course, what are sort of new forms of content creation and use that are mediated by digital technologies? Um, what is its sort of relevance and what are, um, what are the ways in which open knowledge platforms like Wikimedia can contribute to that uh, space, can be a part of that space, right? Um, what is the understanding of community-driven research? Because that for us was the most sort of challenging and um, interesting, I would say, part of the whole sort of exercise, right? So engaging with Indian language communities, 
um, what are the methods, what are the capacities, um, how do we encourage use of both traditional and non-traditional methods, what are additional forms of capacity building needed for research and documentation, um, how can learnings be shared, um, and how replicable are those learnings really across different communities, right? So when we think about just the larger sort of discourse around open research, um, how are sort of our learnings from our own context, from sort of our own sort of experiences of digital infrastructures, really translating across different kinds of geopolitical, um, linguistic, infrastructural con uh, contexts, right? Um, and of course, how do we locate some of this research in the larger sort of open knowledge movement? Um, what collaboration can be fostered with researchers outside of the Wikimedia communities? I think these were sort of the important um, questions that came up. Um, so I'll move on now to talk about some of the other kind of um, uh, questions that have that have um, you know emerged for us in the course of our work on, um, of course, with the A2K program, but also digital infrastructures more broadly. Um, so I work in an area uh, where I've engaged with um, this field called digital humanities, um, work with digital archives. And um, there's a very interesting paper by uh, Paul Arthur and Arthur and um, Lydia Hearn, uh, which is on, uh, on precisely this topic, on advancing open research in the humanities. Um, where they talk about some of its challenges, which can be, you know, um, just in terms of the whole publishing ecosystem, awareness about open access policies, um, and just the practice of, um, you know, sharing research data, tools, software, etc. Right, and they also talk about um, efforts that can be made in this direction, which is collaboration, citizen engagement. Um, making humanities research data tools, software materials more findable, accessible, interoperable, uh, reusable in fair ways, um, and at the same time ensuring sustainable preservation and um, archiving of research outputs. So they particularly point out the emphasis um, within this discourse on open research across um, you know, on uh, open science, sorry, the emphasis on open science, um, which has a sort of underlying theme of positivism and the need for expanding our um, understanding of open research across disciplines. So, you know, here, of course, I'm talking about the humanities, but, you know, arts and culture, um, looking at, you know, different sort of paradigms and epistemologies, which are characteristics of, um, characteristic of these disciplines, right? So I think these were sort of similar questions that emerged for us from the sort of you know, community focused, community facing research and scholarship that we were um, seeking to engage with. So I think two sort of things that stood out for us really, one is um, just the process of digitization itself and uh, challenges related to digitization. I think that's, that's sort of an ongoing um, thematic and ongoing uh, challenge, really, that, that we continue to sort of engage with as part of the larger E2K program and uh, you know, the work the work that the program does closely with uh, communities. Um, but also for us at CIS in terms of, you know, just engaging with the question of digital infrastructure um, and producing, um, you know, uh, online content, for instance. So, um, and, and for me, I think a key part of, of this has also been, you know, just in our engagement with um, open access archives and, uh, you know, the glam sector, galleries, libraries, archives and museums. So um, the advent of large scale digitization initiatives and how they sort of remediate cultural experiences, um, the emergence of new fields of research, practice and scholarship which are very premised on the availability of digitized corpora. So, you know, open uh, digitized corpora and therefore open data, open infrastructures. Um, how do they sort of clash with our existing imagination around digital infrastructure? For instance, you know, the archival imagination is still rooted in very colonial contexts of administration, governance, etc. So how do we then look at new kinds of archives that have emerged, right? So which are open, distributed, networked, collaborative, um, which derive very much from practices of community-led archiving, for instance. Um, this shift, you know, from archives being a repository space to interpretive space, um, being sort of participatory and generative, 
right? So I think these are sort of changes in the ecosystem which also very much inform how we think about and how we unpack openness itself and therefore how we imagine um, open research. So, um, and of course, you know, questions of ownership, access, privacy, rights, uh, these will also continue to evolve and uh, something I think my colleague will speak about next uh, session in the next presentation. Um, and also then talk briefly about um, just moving on to the question of language, right? So um, again, um, looking at questions of intersectionalities, and this is, you know, coming from, again, recent work that we've done around um, you know, sort of the state of uh, the internet's languages, a report that uh, we had worked on closely with uh, this collective called Who's Knowledge. Um, so what are sort of disparities in the development of multilingual content on the internet as a result of its, you know, imbrication within and perpetuation of systemic uh, inequalities? Um, how are new forms of multilingual content mediated by the internet and digital technologies? What lies behind the content? Um, then looking at this question of multimodality. So the internet is still primarily visual and textual, but then what are other forms of multilingual content, right? So if you look at signs, if you look at um, audio content, if you look at, um, you know, emojis, um, where, are, where is all of this on the internet? What are sort of, what is our sort of ecosystem of ownership and control sort of really, um, how is it engaging with the diversity of content that is available, right? And uh, finally, coming to just rethinking our engagement with open access itself, um, is there a need for um, wider and more nuanced sort of conceptual vocabulary around um, open access itself, right? So drawing from legal discourse, but also beyond that. Like for us, I mean, this was a constant question that came up, I think, in, in our work um, in the research projects as well. So how do you translate the idea of open access across different languages? Um, how do you even translate you know, just, just the words open access or um, questions coming from archiving and digitization, right? So how do you translate metadata or provenance or any of these terms across uh, different languages. So what sort of, how does it move across different uh, conceptual registers? Um, of course, a better awareness and understanding of ownership and regulation of platforms of policy reform that is taking place in these spaces definitely sort of go hand in hand in terms of uh, thinking about um, open research. So I think I'll, uh, I'll stop here. Um, but yeah, looking forward to more uh, questions and uh, of course, more thoughts in continuing this conversation. Thank you. Great, Sneha, I'll turn straight over to Anuba. There is a question for you there that you can type an answer to, or we'll pick up it up later if we have time, but straight over to you, Anuba. Thanks, Nick. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Anuba, and I work at the Center for Internet and Society. Um, I'm a policy researcher and a lawyer by training. And over the past couple of years, I have been working on um, various um, initiatives to reform policy and law, mostly in the copyright law domain, uh, to support access to knowledge, um, to basically support the mission of libraries, um, archives, uh, educators, researchers. So to that end um, of the past two years, um, CIS has been um, a part of a group called the A2K Coalition. And the coalition has been working extensively with um, policymakers, both at the national and the international level, um, with a view to reform copyright law to support the mission of um, you know, the public interest institutions I mentioned earlier. Um, we are primarily working um, at with uh, policymakers who are engaged in negotiations at the World Intellectual Property Organization um, on the agenda item right now uh, at WIPO are uh, two um, broad um, um, sort of uh, items. Uh, one relates to uh, a treaty that is being negotiated um, for the benefit of broadcasting organizations. And the second part relates to limitations and exceptions um, 
within copyright law that would support the mission of um, research libraries, archives, educators, museums. Um, so um, just setting the context straight and um, today's presentation um, will draw from the research and advocacy conducted by the members of this particular coalition. Um, and there are three pillars on which the coalition is working. Um, the objective is to really advance a fair copyright system that um, is based on, well, that respects the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And the three pillars are education, research, and cultural heritage. Within my presentation today, I'll be focusing on the text and data mining aspect of doing research, um, recognizing that it's a fairly modern method of doing research and how it is supported by copyright law. Um, and uh, all of my comments are um, have been thought and articulated by various members of the coalition as well. Um, so I invite you to um, um, visit everything that has been published by the members um, on a website that um, you know the coalition has put together. And I'll share the link to the website at the end of my presentation. Um, so just to sort of summarize, uh, pull the problem together, uh, when it comes to copyright, copyright poses issues to access, dissemination of research, as well as collaboration when it comes to doing research. So it's not just about being able to read or view an article or data, it's also about making copies um, so that the article or the data can be processed or sharing copies of these items for private use, um, including research. Um, copyright laws all over the world and um, many powerful stakeholders in the system, such as publishers, um, often create and enforce restrictive condi conditions on such uses. And this is the problem uh, that has been recognized um, by policymakers at the World Intellectual Property Organization as well. So it is clear that overly restrictive copyright laws impede research. Um, hence, we need to design a copyright law that is fit for research, which would accommodate uh, modern methodologies such as text and data mining, um, which requires technical uses of whole entire works, um, often works that need to be exchanged across borders. So just to give everyone a brief understanding of what limitations and exceptions within copyright law really are, um, in the area of intellectual property law, the idea of property rights over knowledge, innovations, intellectual creations um, has been balanced against the human right of free speech and expression. Um, in specifically copyright law, this right to use knowledge is embodied in legal provisions known as limitations and exceptions. They also go by the terms um, fair dealing and fair use. Different countries use different terms and different styles of incorporating this idea in their legislations. The problem we face today is that while the internet is global, copyright exceptions stop at the border. The research technique of text and data mining that has become essential today, um, which is all about using computational methods to analyze books, images, databases, and other sources, um, it's, it, it, is, it, is, it has come to everyone's attention that a lot of copyright legislations do not necessarily support this specific research method. Um, apart from this, often the sources um, used for text and data mining can be protected by copyright law as well. So overall, we find that copyright laws are silent on the protection of text and data mining style uses. Um, and the existing research exceptions in the copyright law emerge to be inadequate. Um, Tom, can you pull out the first slide, please? Thank you. So this is a slide um, that shows uh, the state of copyright exceptions, uh, well, sorry, research exceptions um, in various countries today. If you look at the countries that are highlighted as green, these countries um, 
as per the reading of their copyright legislation, carry the most open research exception. Um, by open, uh, I mean that the law supports all kinds of research uses and is available uh, for all users as well. Between red and yellow, um, with yellow, there might be some limitations on this particular right that is available to researchers. And when we look at the countries highlighted red, these countries either um, these countries um, either have a limitation, a clear limitation on research exception, um, or they might have no research exception, um, or they only support a quotation style right. That is, they do not allow the use of entire works for research purposes. Right. So this is the particular issue uh, as as you know as articulated in legal language that uh, the coalition is trying to solve for um, there are a couple of routes uh, and suggestions that the coalition has made um so if you look at the policy solutions uh, available um to us to solve this particular issue um, we suggest that there are four things that may be explored. Um, one is to request policymakers to think about enabling cross-border uses of copyrighted materials for text and data mining. Um, now, if you look at uh, the Marrakesh Treaty that has that was designed at the WIPO by policymakers for the uh, you know benefit of visually impaired people. Uh, that particular treaty enables cross-border exchange of uh, adapted works for the benefit of visually impaired people. And it's something uh, similar to that is what we suggest as well. The second thing that policymakers can consider are setting international minimum standards for research. So during the negotiations, uh, you know, countries can reach an agreement on a set of international minimum standards for text and data mining research. This would ensure that all countries permit TDM research and are aligned on the bare minimum standard as well. Um, the third route that can be explored is developing guidance and soft laws on the right for research. Um, this would help countries evaluate their options for reforming their own copyright laws to protect the right to research. Finally, um, nationally, policymakers can amend their laws to explicitly permit text and data mining and other kinds of research uses. And um, it should be ensured that the, the, the clause is worded in a way that uh, you know, makes the exception most open and also to ensure that technicalities such as contractual override and technological measures used to protect words do not impede the freedoms enjoyed by this right. So, um, well, these are the policy solutions proposed um, within the A2K coalition. Um, well, the members are pursuing various kinds of methods to um, ensure uh, incorporation of these solutions. Um, a couple of years back, a few members had proposed a treaty on educational and research activities. This was a civil society proposal. Uh, the treaty would have required that all countries adopt research exceptions, including for computational analysis um, that apply to users of all protected materials by all users across borders. The second method has been to uh, create consensus within members of the A2K coalition and publish statements and letters to policymakers on ongoing negotiations at WIPO. Um, apart from this, um, within the coalition, um, there are academic members who um, regularly um, study the negotiations and the proposals being put forth and provide inputs. And uh, a few civil society members that work actively on ensuring that 
this research and policy work is uh, sent across to policymakers and um, you know, and and there are there is extensive coordination that happens as well. Um, so it's it's really um, efforts happening on various fronts and being um, you know put together um, to sort of mostly effect change at negotiations happening at the world intellectual property organizations. Apart from that, members also look for opportunities. Um, policy windows being created in their own countries or at other international law uh, forums, such as um, if, you know, whenever there are free trade agreements being negotiated. So that's that's how um, we are doing things. And uh, Tom, could you pull up the next slide, please? Has that gone awry? Oh, there we go. Sorry. Yes. So for everyone present here, I would invite you to please take a look at this website. Um, and if you are an institution or you belong to an institution that is interested in joining the coalition, uh, please let us know. Um, um, do, you are most welcome to go through the mission. And there is some research as well that has been published under the three pillars. And I hope that... Um, everyone present here um, sort of, uh, you know, finds this particular website useful. And of course, I look forward to hearing from everyone um, on, on, on it. Thank you so much. Thanks very much, uh, Anuba. And uh, certainly that map's peaked, it's already piqued my interest. And I see Jerome's was interested in that as well. So uh, some really interesting food for thought there. And a couple of questions for you if you have time, but straight over to you, Jody. Um, so if you're quick, uh, we, you don't have to rush, but if, we, if you quick, we have time for a few a few questions, but yeah, um, uh, we've still got a, a fair amount of time for you, so over okay. to you. I'm just sharing my screen. Oops. Can everyone see that? Yep, that's fine. Great. Okay. So I'm Jody Double. I'm the digital content and copyright manager at the University of Leeds. So I manage digitization, digital preservation, copyright and licensing um, for special collections and also for the university. Um, I also in a prior role manage the research repositories. So my en entire career at Leeds and other organizations have been around copyright open research, open knowledge, and open access. So I'm very pleased to be part of this this panel and um, I've, I've been frantically scribbling notes and we'll be following up on other things too. So what I'd like to say at the beginning is I've come to see copyright and IP as an opportunity and not a barrier with, um, on the journey in my own career and trying to help others understand that too for uh, a lot of collections and also students and staff at institutions, I think they hear the word copyright and instantly think that they can't do it when in fact um, understanding the law and the context can actually help enable you to do this and help to push boundaries. And so the other speakers on this panel, I'm, it's, it's amazing to hear their work. So what I'm going to do is talk through the journey at Leeds of what we've been going through toward open research. Because uh, in special collections and galleries, we don't necessarily use the word open research or open knowledge, but in fact, that is what we've been doing since the beginning. So when I came to Leeds in 2009, um, digitization had been undertaken prior through commercial providers or um, small scale local digitization. And, and it was, as many institutions did, it was, it was the easy things, the things in the public domain or things that were very low risk. And we took a stance to actually establish a studio and bring it all in-house. And what we did for the first couple of years was, you know, because the collections are extensive, um, will never be finished. We, we did all the 
items that we really thought were easy in the public domain, like I said, and then we started hitting collections that we needed to take a different approach to. And since we were risk averse, we decided to flip it and look at what Welcome was doing and actually take a risk managed approach because we wanted to open up the collections. We saw there was a research need and we wanted to connect the collections globally. So we uh, established a risk management approach in 2015 that we're actually going to be reviewing and renewing again. And because of that, we generated 3 million images uh, also in-house and through partnerships with Internet Archive through the um, UK Medical Heritage Library. And then COVID hit and we again had to pivot. And one of the things that came out of COVID was that we realized that um, access to arts and humanities material um, was quite difficult. So because of that, the university generously funded a mass digitization scoping project. So we started that in 2022 and the team was amazing. They literally surveyed the entirety of special collections and galleries collections in addition to the main collection to understand what the research potential was, where were their copyright and GDPR and data protection issues, uh, where, where were their pockets of content that we knew there was research potential globally, but we actually, there was no cataloging. Uh, we didn't actually know the scale of it um, and verifying what our catalog said against the reality in the stacks. So that completed in July and we'll be publishing a report on that at some point when we finalize that and moving into actually active digitization. And one of the things, almost dropping the word mass digitization, because I think that's sort of a barrier to a lot of collections too, and calling it sustainable strategic digitization, because that is in effect what it is. Mass digitization can sometimes throw up a barrier where somebody says, oh, are you done yet? With all these collections globally, we'll never be done. There's always new content being created digitally um, and also the capacity in the sector to do this. Yeah, I'll be, I'll be long retired and we won't even have scratched the surface. Some collections, when they say what you're done at, it's 3% and then something might be added and then also it'll drop down to two. So that's one thing that came out of COVID and just being very responsive to that. And in terms of digitization, also the university, uh, when we were talking about infrastructure, so I'm glad infrastructure was brought up in the prior talk. In order to actually connect our collections globally, we need open infrastructures. So at Leeds, there's the Digital Library Infrastructure Project that started, and that is looking at our systems and how we can make the collections open. How are they easily reusable? How can we capitalize on all the pre-COVID experimentation that we were doing on collections in terms of transcription and Wikimedia and Wikidata and linked to data in general? We can't do this alone. And if we do want to connect our collections and make them openly accessible, we need to capitalize on others. So that's just a very high, high level overview because I kind of want to get to the questions because that's where the really interesting part is. And if anybody wants any of the reports or any of our um, risk management workflows, just please get in contact with me. And I also want to uh, talk to the community in general so that we we build these resources for others to share. So looking ahead, so we have um, sustainable strategic digitization and digital library infrastructure where we're looking at open standards. We want to collect and connect our collections on fair principles because they should be findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable, and also standards-based. So we want to also build on the what happened during the COVID period where we were experimenting and we were openly collaborating. And we were also doing that prior to that, but just making sure that we connect our collections globally. We may have a part of a collection and another institution has letters or objects that unite it. We can't do it alone um, and cultural collections are distributed around the world. 
And with this network and also other networks, thinking about how do we work together um, and how do we share as a network? Because that's that's the power of the community. So Lee's just doing one thing alone doesn't mean it actually is holistically better. So especially with risk management, uh, ideally, globally, people could be feeding into that and so that we can support each other. And it also have a local context. Not everybody's going to have the same appetite for risk. But if your institution sees that, oh, actually, it was okay, they have these safeguards around it. This is what happened. They can go to their senior managers and say, look, this institution is doing this. Here's a workflow and a strategy. Uh, please support me in this area and, and give it a go. And uh, hopefully the community can support you in that also. So between uh, all the organizations and Ken and uh Wikimedia, I think we're in a in a good place coming out of COVID to take a lot of this activity forward. And uh, hopefully what we release at Leeds, others can build on also. So I was just being quick so we can get to the questions. That's great, Jody. Thanks very much. Um, we have got a few minutes for questions and there have been a few that's been posted. There's one for Sneha, um, that I think talks to some of the things that you were just talking to as well. And I know Sneha has said that she she wants to answer that live, so we'll come to that in a minute. But I did just want to pick up first, if I could, on the question from Chadia um, about the reliability and quality of, of Wikimedia, because I think that's a crucial point. And I think it's a bit of a misunderstanding about how it actually works as well. I've certainly learned a lot around that. And I know you've answered it a little bit, Lucy. Um, but just before I hand over to you, I mean, my... my it's a, Wikipedia is only good, as good as its contributors, isn't it, essentially? And it's about the diversity of those, that contributor base. And I suppose the argument I'm making is, you know, that's why, in my view, universities need to engage more with the platform because they have the experts. You Google anything, where do you land? You land on Wikipedia. And we have a certain responsibility to make sure it's as accurate as possible and, and as well cited as possible. But yeah, I'll hand over to you on that, Lucy. Yeah, thanks, Nick. Um, I mean, as I mentioned, there are inbuilt mechanisms. Um, there's a lot of work done by by bots um, on Wikipedia. Wikipedia has been using bots for 20 years, um, but also human moderators. I mean, there are, I mentioned the hundreds of thousands of contributors, but some people contribute by looking out for mistakes, for vandalism, for errors, um, correcting things. Um, I mean, I know just as a very uh, novice editor, really, that, um, you know, if I if I write something that isn't properly referenced, someone will put me up on it and it'll be reverted or, um, you know, I need, I need to improve it. So there are there are also quality assurance mechanisms and featured articles, good article status. But having said all of that, I, I would advise you with any with anything that you're reading, whether it's on the Internet or, you know, uh, in an actual newspaper or, or a non-fiction book you know check as I'm sure you do <laughs> you know you need to look behind um to see where that's coming from so I think that, that it's really vital actually that Wikimedia is trying to um, develop those information and media literacy skills and not just saying here's all this great information um you know for me it is about that whole holistic offer where um you know we're trying to build and develop the content trying to diversify the content and the contributors trying to increase that as a movement trying to increase access around the world that's not so much something that the community uk is doing but certainly trying to engage people at an early stage we're really keen to start working more in schools um because you know people navigating the information ecosystem need to be able to question things at the same time as we are continually improving the content you know and the reliability and so on mm -hmm. No, oh, great. Thank, thank you. Um, do please post any more questions. We still have got a few minutes, but just to come to this anonymous attendee, I'm not sure who that is. Uh, perhaps reveal yourself in chat if you would like. But um, the question about shared digital infrastructure, I mean, that sort of touches on some of the things that you were talking about, Jody. Um, and I suppose I'd be, just for my two penneth, is the fact that, you know, Wikimedia is, is a shared digital infrastructure. But we need to be able to make sure that the materials that we're generating, whether it's research outputs, research papers, special collections, is openly licensed. That's the other question in terms of making sure stuff's openly licensed so that it can then be included on what is already a scalable infrastructure. And actually, I've spent a lot of time talking to Martin about the fact that, you know, you might build something for a project that has to be maintained um, and then it'll die. In you know, Jody and I both had that experience. And in fact, the scalable 
um, global infrastructure that Wikimedia Commons uh, provides does actually Wikimedia Commons or Wikimedia in general. But yeah, I don't know um, if you'd like to speak to that as well, Sneha. If you're still there. Yeah. Right. I'm I'm here. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, just just sort of to reiterate some of the things that uh, Lucy mentioned as well, right? And Jodi was speaking about. I think just scalability is definitely one thing. And um, you know, um, when I was I was thinking about what you just mentioned, Nick, about um, Wikipedia or Wikimedia projects being you know essentially a form of shared open digital infrastructure and a knowledge infrastructure and that, right? Um, also, the sort of um, there is a certain resistance to engage with it from a pedagogic academic perspective, right? So I think that uh, already poses a kind of significant uh, challenge, and uh, I think we do see that with other kinds of uh, open uh, digital infrastructures as well. You know, just in terms of uh, how much do we engage with um, open access platforms um, in the course of, uh, say, classroom education. Um, so I think that definitely poses a challenge in terms of uh, developing and scaling up um, digital infrastructures. The other thing is digital pedagogy. Um, you know, what are sort of pedagogic strategies that encourage us to use, um, you know, shared research data? How can you sort of optimize our use of uh, research data that is available on, you know, various uh, open access knowledge platforms? I think that's another um, sort of challenge. Um, within the higher education space, I think so much of our thinking around open research is still very much structured by existing, the existing publishing ecosystem, right? I see that there's another question there as well, um, you know, uh, just, just how will sort of um, an increased investment in uh, open licensing uh, change the way that, you know, we think about management of, um, you know, of uh, research data as such. Um, so I think that's that's a large question, and there's just so much more that needs to go into you know thinking about that. I think just the existing publishing um, ecosystem, um, a sort of a consistent challenge has also been publishing, for instance, in Indian languages. Right, there are very little like the resources that we have to be able to produce more content, academic content in Indian languages, publishing in Indian languages, for yeah. instance. Right, it's, it's being done in very specific spaces. Um, so when you think about this, and uh, we're again thinking largely about textual data, about um, data of a certain kind, um, if we think about, um, you know, just the affordances of the internet and the kind of diversity of data that that is now possible, right, with, with the internet. So even if you're looking back within a higher education space, um, what kind of shared infrastructure can actually account for this kind of multimodality? can facilitate sharing, can facilitate collaboration, and can facilitate thinking about a form of, of say, critical digital pedagogy that, you know, that really leverages these various affordances, right? So I think that, for me, forms like a significant challenge when we're thinking about infrastructure. It's, it's a challenge and an opportunity. I mean, I, I get very excited thinking about what all can be done. Uh, there are limitations, but I think thinking about it together definitely sort of helps in addressing some of those. Uh, oh, thanks, Neha. I mean, uh, obviously, we could talk about this for a lot longer. I'll just come to you finally, Jody. But, you know, if any thoughts on that, you did mention our digital inform inform infrastructure transformation project here at Leeds. Have you got any additional thoughts just before we wrap up on the infrastructure question? No, I just I, th I think we have a quite an exciting period coming up where we are looking at linked data and and trying to connect everything and yeah, uh, connecting it up through PIDs, permanent identifiers, and the IIIF platforms. That's that's definitely the future. And I I'm I am looking forward to what happens with AI and uh, what we can do with our collections because I know it's it's causing a lot of fear in a lot of communities but actually it's it's been around a while with other things and transcription it's 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 managing that fear versus what you what you can do so i was just answering the question about um creative commons licenses so. yeah well that, i mean that just on that point because that is a good point i don't know if anybody uh, i'm sure lucy will be and others maybe with the wiki uh, women in red project which is trying to improve gender representation on on wikipedia um, and there's a there's a Twitter uh, X um, account that's always asking for images of scientists, f female scientists, 
because they're all copyright university of such and such you know so even something as basic as that just getting an inf uh, you know a picture of a scientist that's uh, available open access can be difficult because it's not openly licensed so uh, that is an issue but obviously we've only just scratched the surface but we have just passed the hour so thank you for ev everybody for coming and contributing thanks to our speakers we will be publicizing uh, more ken sessions in the next couple of days and love to welcome you again to future sessions and spread the word Please do sign the declaration, um, find the declaration. I'll just post the link again there if you haven't already done so. Um, you know, this it is just, you know, there's no commitment. Well, if you but on the behalf of, a, of an organization, um, you know, if you can get your organization to commit to some of the principles of the declaration, but as an ind individual, you can sign up to it as well. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you for coming and please stay in touch, get in touch with us again. And uh, we'll certainly be following up, won't we, Jody, um, uh, with uh, our colleagues from. India and uh, working more with Wikimedia. So thanks everybody for coming and uh, speak to you again soon. Thank you. Goodbye. <laughs>